Okay. Welcome to Poor People's Revolution Radio Special Zoom Series. You can find us at 96.1 FM on the dial in Oakland and stream at www.poormagazine.org slash radio. And I am the sexy black cripples. And who is this? Yeah, I'm crazy, lazy, dumb, and a bum. Anti-social workers and case manglers call me because my knowledge don't come from the institution. Yeah, I'm the poverty scholar, that houseless mama, that houseless daughter. I'm rocking my jailhouse attire because me and Ma did a jail time, just three months. Nowhere close to my comrades on today uh, for the poverty crime of being unhoused in this occupies indigenous holler. And yeah, this is PNN, not CNN people. Welcome to the third week of From Katrina to Corona. As poor and indigenous people led solutions to poverty and COVID-19 versus government politrickster solutions, which we already know do nothing but put us in the ground, incarcerate, test, and arrest us. And so to ground us a little bit in the indigenous and poor people solutions, we're gonna lift that up by, first of all, introducing some of my fellow poverty scholars right here at Homefulness. And by the way, poverty scholarship, if people don't know, because any of y'all fo- co-poverty scholars already know that that's our life. Uh, for poor folks, theory is our life, what we live through and what we struggle with. But I'm gonna turn it over to my brother, Mutiabo. Mm-hmm. Hey, this Mutiabo, silencio, presente y me alegro. Uh, this Mutiado Silencio, uh, one of the uh, many co-founders of Homefulness and also the PNN, Revolutionary Radio Broadcaster. Uh, and again, we're broadcasting right here live from uh, Homefulness. And yes, which is a homeless, uh, indigenous uh, people-led solution to homelessness. Uh, you know, to the lie of rent, to the lie of buying, selling my mother, the solution with landless folks called Homefulness. And this is D. Allen, one of the other residents of Hopefulness. To ground us in the theme of this series, we will hear from Elder Malik Rahim from Common Ground Collective in Louisiana, who struggled with the first political bullshit that was Hurricane Katrina. You have that, Levi, or you want me to? Get it. Uh, no, you, uh, the, you, you, you. Hold on, guys. Um, sorry, guys. Again, technical difficulties on this side. Okay. Right now, we are experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> Please stand by as we correct the problem. <laughs> Exactly. Oh my God, though. Okay, wait. That's why we had tech. I just, I, and I, and I was so prepared, and then I got all unprepared. So there you go. A story for you. Okay, here we go. Pearl, are you there? Don't, hold on. They're all muted. Okay. Here I go. am muted. Okay. You have unmuted me. Uh oh. Hold on. Uh oh. Uh oh. Okay. Oh shit. 
what you do. <laughs> I love it. Earl is officially unmuted. Watch out, family. Unmuted. Kind of cute self. All right. Okay, so I hope I'm gonna be able to get this up. Does everybody see that? Yeah, I see it. Yep. Yeah. Between the room, all the lives. Oh gosh, I can't. Now I can't get this on. Damn it! Uh, just, just play play. Well, yeah, that would be good if I could. But I can't. Why? It's, it's down there. It's, it's... No, but it was covered. So uh, it goes again being covered. <sighs> no, don't go back. Uh. No. that if we would have stood up You're as a it? people yeah. out of Katrina, mm. it wouldn't have had a Black Lives mm. Matter. Mm. It, wouldn't been a Negro. it wouldn't have been a Jim. It wouldn't have been a Ferguson. Right. We could have ended it right here. Right. But because we allow uh, whatever Compensation, some of us receive. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, allow some of the blatantest, the, the most blatant racism to ever happen in this country yeah. to happen here and went unattested. You know, I mean, right now, there have never been a, a, a member of the vigilantes that roamed these streets to be arrested for anything. You, uh, and, and, and most people forgot that Gretna closed their borders to blacks and wouldn't allow blacks into Gretna. And, and most people don't even want to hear about the how uh, that that the levy was being breached mm -hmm. and they didn't warn nobody. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody wanted to hear this. Right. But see now. Now we are under a person that's worse than yeah. mm -hmm. that. We are under a person that I would call Bush with steroids. Right. And we are still caught ill prepared. Right. We are still in that same position. That's one of the reasons why you see all the tools and stuff that I have here. Because this is one of the things I'm teaching young brothers in this community is uh, hey, we ain't going to never get caught again ill-prepared to take care of ourselves in the aftermath of a disaster. Now, so that, that was Malik Rahim from Common Ground in Louisiana. We will be hearing more from an over two-hour interview for Magazine Day with him at this time last year. When we visited New Orleans and Malik was struggling with politics and fake ant solutions in Katina. Today's show is focused on the deep struggles of people inside the razor wire plantations and the goal of poor magazine in this series for us folks is to speak for ourselves. So we are blessed to be joined with some fellow poverty scholars who are also incarceration scholars, work on the front line of the struggle bins inside those razor wire plantations we sell. So we've got powerful poverty scholar and author, survivor of the torture cell, as he calls it, at Pelican Bay, and radio broadcaster, PN and KXU. That's Free Aslan, JV, Joey Villarreal. Welcome to Poor People's Radio. Um, you can hear his show, by the way, on KXU. 96.1 FM every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. He does free Aslan. We're also joined on the phone in a interesting <laughs> roundabout because this Zoom shit is hard for all us poverty scholars uh, by Minister King William, um, a member of uh, a lot of different struggles and a powerful leader himself, um, as well as Brooke from International Workers Organizing Committee and Jose Bernal, 
who is from who works with the uh, Ella Baker Center, uh, and as well is a is a scholar in this work. Uh, so welcome everybody to Four People's Radio for Katrina to Corona, um, and maybe we could get started by hearing from Jose on the local struggle with San Santa Rita. Mm. Well, that's real. And we know yeah. our folks are inside that plantation getting sick. Yeah. And um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this Zoom session. And, um, you know, the, the Santa Rita, they just, you know, they just found another prisoner was just tested um, positive for this, you know, virus. And this is just recently, I believe today, an another prisoner. So, the prisoners, you know, um, they should let them out. Most of the prisoners in there, Santa Rita especially, have not been convicted. They're in there awaiting trial. And if they were, you know, being held in a jail and, you know, if they were from, um, you know, I've said this many times, if they were from uh, Los Altos or some of these uh, more affluent Saratoga Hills, um, they would not be sitting in jail they would be bailed out or, you know, they would, um, you know, have lawyers to negotiate them to, um, you know, come in later for court or whatever. But because the most, most people in Santa Rita um, are poor people, um, you know, they're trapped in there. So, and, you know, if you look at it, um, you know, in that aspect, then what it comes down to is poor prisoners die from Corona and, you know, prisoners with money get to come out and, and, and social distance. So this is definitely a, a class contradiction that we're seeing. Um, and once these bodies start dropping <coughs> and they start putting them in these body bags, um, then this example is going to become more, more, more real right now. It's, it's kind of like, you know, in the abstract, but once we start seeing these bodies coming out of Santa Rita and the prisons, then we are going to start realizing that this, this class contradiction that people keep talking about, where when you got money, you, you are kept out of harm's way, but if you're poor, you're gonna be held in, in, you know, in prisons and jail cells uh, within arm's distance from people who are infected. Not only that, but even outside of prisons and jail, we see this um, where people on reservations or in poor communities, um, these are the communities where they create these dump sites. These are communities where they, um, you know, they put these toxic chemical sites, you know, and, and so um, it, it's, it's just a long history. Um, it's a long chain uh, uh, um, this, this oppressive um, way that we are treated just because um, we may be um, living in poverty, we are, you know, our life's in danger because of that. So that, that's something that this Corona thing is bringing to the surface and it's helping to highlight and educate people that this, this stuff we talk about when you're poor, your life's in danger. That's something that's very real. The prisoners provide us with a real concrete example that when you're poor, your life is literally in danger. And when you have money, your life is not in danger because you can, you know, get on a yacht and you can sail around the world uh, away from all this stuff going on. So it's it's a very very real thing these uh, class class contradictions that we are struggling against. Beautiful. Yeah. Can you take out um, um, Malik's picture so we can look at everybody? Thank you. Okay. And then maybe we can hear from uh, Jose Bernal as well, who's on this struggle. And then Brooke. Yeah, um, and I think that's all real. Thank, thanks for having me, by the way, uh, on here to speak on this. Um, I think, um, you know, we touch, touch when we talk about Santa Rita Jail and we talk about, you know, um, that institution in and of itself, the carceral state, what it is, what it represents is, you know, to give a little historical context is that Santa Rita jail, we've been seeing bodies drop left and right. That's not uh, an anomaly. That's not rare. That's not new. It's actually uh, one of the jails with um, the leading um, high rate number of in custody deaths, even more than Los Angeles County, uh, which is the largest jailer in the nation. 
Um, since 2014, we've looked at uh, at least 47 in custody deaths that we know of. Um, there are likely more. Uh, you know, uh, that's a whole nother show, a whole nother you know topic to tell you how they report those in custody deaths and they don't. Um, we saw um, uh, we've seen a number, a significant number of human rights abuses. Uh, people uh, who are being treated with um, the most egregious, egregious forms that you could, you know, ever treat anyone um, from forcing a pregnant mother to give birth alone in an isolation cell to uh, throwing feces in someone's face. Um, just some really, really horrific atrocities have taken place inside Santa Rita Jail. Uh, it's not exclusive to the entire carceral state up and down this nation. Um, but it certainly is uh, one of the most egregious jails in this entire nation. And um, the amount of money that's poured into that na that that jail is, is disgusting. Um, we're talking almost half a billion dollars a year to keep you know the entire Alameda County Sheriff's Office running. Uh, and with this coronavirus, uh, I just want to go over a few things. Is um, the average daily population in Santa Rita Jail uh, at the beginning of uh, March uh, was close to 2,600. Um, thanks to a lot of uh, grassroots organizations uh, and folks on the ground, that um, population has gone down. It's now about, uh, as of uh, yesterday, it was 1738. Um, so that's a significant decrease. And again, that's in, in great part uh, to all of the advocacy, all of the uh, work that folks are doing on the ground. Uh, but even with those numbers, uh, you're going to see that um, there, in terms of testing for coronavirus, there's only been 106 tests completed. Uh, and again, out of 2,600, only 106 tests. Out of those tests, we've already seen 34 cases that have been positive, uh, plus two staff that were confirmed positive. That makes it one of the largest uh, outbreaks in the entire state of California. Uh, so in total, we're talking 36 confirmed positive cases at Santa Rita Jail uh, since March 1st. Uh, which makes it one of the highest in the entire state. Um, what we're hearing directly from people inside and their families uh, is consistent. Uh, it, con it contradicts what the jail is saying and what the um, Alameda County Sheriff's Office is saying. Um, we're hearing that people are experiencing symptoms. Uh, people are, you know, wanting to be tested. They're not being tested. Uh, we're also hearing that people are not getting seen, um, which is, again, a standard. It's normal. Uh, Pre-COVID-19 times, you know, myself included, when I was incarcerated, not at that jail, different jail, but, um, you know, you put in a sick call and then, you know, it'll take days, if not weeks, before the, anyone even comes around to see you. Uh, that's still happening, um, you know, with people experiencing flu-like symptoms. Uh, the jail, Santa Rita Jail, there's a private medical provider that's a multi-billion dollar private medical provider, WellPath. Um, last year, they recorded uh, they were worth something like $54 billion. Um, they have enough money to test everyone. They have enough money to treat everyone. They won't, um, you know, and so, you know, these are the things that we're hearing. We're also hearing that people on the inside are not getting uh, proper uh, per um, personal protective equipment along with um, hygiene supplies. Um, and so uh, these are very, very serious things that are happening. This is an unimaginable nightmare waiting to happen. Uh, it's not enough to just release some people and leave others behind, uh, which is why we're demanding um, that everyone be released. Uh, you know, it's, it's hypocritical for, um, you know, county officials and state officials to close down schools and close down other institutions to say that it's unsafe. But at the same time, uh, we're leaving, um, you know, 1,700 folks left in Santa Rita jail to essentially die. Um, you know, that, that is unconscionable. Uh, the jails and prisons right now are just not safe, period. They've never been safe. Uh, and that's been exasperated by this COVID-19 crisis. And so, um, yeah, that, you know, um, kind of where we're at right now with that. Wow. Okay, so, you know, we, we know that in this green crisis, you know, institutionalized people are not only at risk, but dying, you know, from nursing homes to jails to prisons, you know, and um, I, you know, I, I want to, I want to um, give a shout out to um, this organization called HERD, H-E-A-R-D, Helping Educate to Advocate the Rights of Deaf 
communities where they do a lot of um, advocacy for deaf and disabled prisoners. You know, we talk about prisoners and a lot of prison activism don't talk about disabled and deaf prisoners. You know, so I like to, you know, give a shout out to them. But Tiny? Yeah, I, and I just want to say, first of all, thank you, everybody. Um, and I want to hear from Brooke and Minister King, but I, I just wanted to say that it's really interesting how frighteningly similar uh, the shelter crisis that we're dealing with, where basically we already know that these these uh, shelters are other forms of soft jails. You know, once you so-called outside, most of our, you know, uh, when they come out jail, oftentimes we're houseless. We end up in the shelters where you're also absolutely non-hygienic with or without a coronavirus. So I just want to lift that up. Right. Yeah, in, in, in group homes. Exactly. Yeah. Group homes, nursing homes, you name it. Where us poor people end up. Laguna Honda. Oh, my God. Anyway. Okay. Sorry, Brooke. Please give us your scholarship. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. One small item of correction that uh, you couldn't have known, but Oakland is now an autonomous group. We're de-affiliating with the IWW. And with IWOC, we're basically still networked with all kinds of people. But um, sh what do you want me to talk on even? I mean, Jose, both the Jose's talked on Santa Rita a little bit, but also it has to be mentioned that right now, under cover of the crisis, the sheriff is making a grab to basically increase the sheriff's department by 30%. Mm. By to grab another hundred and six million dollars a year and increase the number of guards in Santa Rita by over three hundred. Mm. They snuck it on the agenda like light Friday night to be uh, spoken on and like voted on Tuesday. You know, potentially voted on Tuesday. It's already been like punted down the road twice when we mobilized to kill it. So like coming up tomorrow, like the everyone's got to be on deck basically to flood the board of supervisors' phones and emails and basically let them know like their job is in crisis if they vote this thing through you know, you, in the middle of a crisis when basically it's being proven that any number of people can be decarcerated without any crime wave the sheriff is grabbing for more money but uh but that aside um i'm, I'm just going to read i mean the response across the state i'll speak on cdcr and basically nationally a little bit but um the response has been really uneven and it's also changed over time um uh, a lot of systems are different but here in California, um, it's been really uneven, but CDCR has been really sly in the way they've managed media and in the way they worked with the governor to release 3,500 people to basically, um, basically short circuit legal ar arguments to release 17,000 more. Wow. You know, it's a very effective propaganda campaign that a lot of advocates have basically bought into too. So let's get into that. But first, um, I'm just gonna read a two reports straight from the inside that I got this afternoon. One from inside, um, I won't name the prison, but inside a state prison in Georgia. Hey dude, just filling you in. They moved us to the gym today. Why wow, this is gonna suck. They did feed us pizza in an effort to pacify us. We bucked on them once we got in there. The captain told us we had to roll our mats up every day at eight to 4.30 and we couldn't get back on our mats all day and we had to be inspection ready at all times. We all started screaming at her instantly. The cert team jumped up, that's the SWAT team, the internal goons, jumped up instantly. They knew we were right. They didn't step to us, plus there was 120 of us. We told them we ain't getting ready for shit. She bowed up and they told us to shut up and the next person that spoke was gonna get locked up, sent to the hole. We all jumped up and said, lock us up. At least we'll have a bed. She locked up three people for speaking up. But they came back in later per the warden. We told her to get out and leave us alone. She left and came back and said the warden said he didn't care if we slept all day. Hey, I guess if we still have a little bucket us, Ha ha, exclamation point. They put 21 people in our dorm. The website only says we have two positive cases though. So maybe they're lying or maybe they just put 21 in the dorm and they haven't been confirmed yet. Mm. So basically people are being moved into mass dorm situations in order to create isolation wards, finally. Like a month and a half late from when people were telling people to do this, like a month and a half ago. Same situation, we got a message from inside Chino, mm. where, which is a hot spot here in California. Um, from a family member um, of someone that's 73 years old, uh, immunocompromised and been trying to get out, had his court case denied for early release. So uh, let's see, where's the report? 
Though only 10% of the prisoners wear their masks, only enforced if the sergeant has come in. Not all COs wear them. The COs, COs also go from sick dorms to not sick dorms, and doesn't seem like they take precautions at all. Tents are up on the yards, but guys are not happy about sleeping on cots. Not nearly enough testing. Seems like they had only test guys once they know you're a positive. Sanitizer stations are empty. No way to clean phone unless you have your own cleaner. They moved all the upper bunk guys to cots and the tents on the yard. So basically, they're, they're making prisoners camp out on the yard, just like they made the brothers in Georgia like camp out in a dorm or a gym. Basically, even this is in Chino, which has had like a ton of international attention on it as like the hotspot inside California. I mean, two weeks ago, it passed Lancaster as the place with the most cases inside, you know, California. But still, they're not testing people. And when they do consequently test people, they find they have huge numbers of people that are basically asymptomatic and spreading it around. So the situation from Georgia to California is remarkably similar. Now the prisons are basically, you know, they're not going to be releasing any more people. You know, this is my read. I was surprised when they did it in the first place. You know, I wasn't anticipating that. But the nature of the crisis kind of forced them into it. Also, the, the, the nature of the uproar. Because now we've even find on, like, uh, CBS, like, Sunday morning, we have, we have people that did time doing interviews on the situation inside prisons. So it's actually penetrating the, the corporate pig media. You know, which is basically symptomatic of, like, how deep the crisis is. That they are, like, having to move to contain and, like, re-narrate the crisis that's, like, spiraling out of control. Wow. You know. So, I mean, and like in terms of like that kind of case management, that kind of crisis management and appearances management, I got to hand it to Newsom. It was genius. Basically, um, coast to coast, the headline of 3,500 released as an emergency member to like stop spread inside California prisons, it made headlines like all over the country, even the globe. And Newsom got painted as some like progressive politician. This was done 36 hours before a case was be heard in federal court where they, CDCR was basically pressed to prove that they were taking measures to release people that were defined by an early federal case, you know, Coleman and, and Plata, which was basically the medical case about valley fever and medical conditions forcing like the measures against crowding. There was actually a class of prisoners that was up for release that numbered 17,000. So CDCR did this preemptive move, gained the narrative, basically convinced everyone they were on the leading edge of releasing people short-circuited the federal judge case. The federal judges are just looking for a way to deny releases. They gave them political cover. And so therefore those, those legal cases are now dead in the water. Wow. And the effectiveness of that propaganda is inhibiting like the movement's ability to like levy crisis, to build a crisis, a political crisis for these figures in order to make them to move. Because unfortunately we just can't go out there with wire cutters and like start cutting down fences. There's still an institutional battle. There's a hearts and minds battle. And like, that's where a lot of this battle is being fought. And I'm also like, we're in like a real middle period. There was like a very kind of anxious and like frenetic pace for outside advocates and prisoner groups and inside formations um, in terms of like how they were organizing initially. And we've come up against some really like deep limits. I mean, I'd like to talk about those a little bit, limits in terms of tactics limits in terms of movements, and also just limits in terms of thinking. Because basically, I don't want to see another set of demands, you know, period. At this point, demands are, I mean, there are all kinds of demands, but at this point, the demands that are being made, they're essentially ultimatums. And unless you can back them up, they're basically an elaborate form of begging. Mm. I wouldn't pay attention to them either. Mm. You know, there's got to be something to back it up or else you're just demonstrating weakness. You know, so we've got to take it to a different level. We've got to shift gears. So I'll leave it there. Right. Um, powerful words. I do want to say it also sounds like, again, let's connect the dots, right? Inside and outside the razor wire plantations, they warehouse in houseless folk. In Hawaii, they're moving everybody out of tents where they're safely sheltering and moving them into giant high school gyms and uh, making people sit in, or basically lay next to each other, which we know our politrickster in the Ila occupied the Ilamu tribe, but people shot her down, but they're still doing it. Ain't no hotel rooms for our no houseless folk. Mm. So yeah, thank you for speaking on that. Um, Minister King, you wanna try to talk a little bit and get in this weird, crazy way here? Yeah, uh, it's 
and it's the King James California Prison Broke is the King Universal. Um, I come here today uh, to let you guys know what's going on. Some of the brothers inside. Um, you, can get a, you can get a real, uh, a real feeling on seriously this situation is the end of themselves. So I want to introduce my brother so they can speak on the situation. Uh, this is Jay. This is James uh, JB. Uh, greetings, everybody in solidarity. Solidarity from the, the freedom from the freedom and justice project. Uh, that, that's a good point, Tiny. Uh, but before I go a little further, uh, here at our office, uh, I also have available with me uh, some more brothers. I let them introduce themselves so y'all can get an inside view of where we stand. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, Greetings, everyone. Greetings. I believe we got Brother Kali. Is you there? Or maybe not. Okay. Uh, so, so this this is what we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at, and, and our project has been monitoring uh, uh, California CDC uh, with a little arm. Uh, since the mid '80s, when they ushered in from uh, uh, the liberal camp, after they got rid of uh, Chief Justice uh, Susan Rosenberg and Duke Mage and the Vandy Captain took over and, and created what became known as the California Prison Board. And, and and in that reality, we see uh, a lot of uh, government uh, corruption that that when was created, what was known as Control units or even the supermax uh, control units known as Southern Bay Shoe. And ushered in with that, they ushered in uh, 30 plus years of torture that they have subjected. Uh, so many of the fellows who, uh, that uh, went through that in the service shoe and was tortured, uh, went in there as youthful young men and women and came out as aging elders. Uh, the church had compromised their system and made them susceptible to COVID-19. Mm. And uh, uh, at no time have we seen that uh, had showed any accountability for decades of torture. Uh, they started in the late 80s and, and continued up to the, uh, uh, the hunger strike. And uh, what, we, what we have seen now in the civil rights movement, 19 has actually put them at, at, at high risk on uh, yeah. And root of that historical backdrop is what is called indefinite sentence. So you have these guys who have to serve twice, if not three times, over their sentences. One example of one case is a guy who was for parole in 1976. So because these, the CDC little more subjected them to that, uh, 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 he has done 51 years uh, uh, plus that. Uh, so, so we have many instances where we have both tortured class members, as you have heard about in the class action, Asker versus uh, uh, Brown. And we have now these very members as well as others that, that uh, are susceptible to expose to what we would consider to be a death civil death sentence because mm. the state, including the parole authorities, have not put any action to rectify decades long uh, of holding them way past their citizens. And, and at this time, they're, they're, they're at risk of being subjected to death because of the COVID-19. Uh, or many of the cases, uh, they're, they're spread out throughout California, and when they when they sit, they mail in, they report in. We see that uh, CDC with little R is not even considering. With that in mind, we see the dots that's being connected is running all two branches of the, of, of the government. Uh, the executive branch, of course, of, uh, of CDC and the parole authorities fall up under the governor's uh, office. And then you, it runs into the legislative branch where during this California prison boom, uh, which went from nine uh, prisons in, in, in mid-2019 mid, uh, 
uh, late 80s, uh, all the way to now 34 prisons. Uh, a lot of taxpayers' money went from what was once a billion dollar budget to a billion dollar budget, and still the government is holding no accountability for these, these atrocities. So we want to be able to bring that into the discussion today if everyone is uh, open. And uh, I just want to do that backdrop, and I'll, try, I'll turn it over now to anyone else would like to add, add to that. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, along with what Brother Brown was saying, uh, we have a lot of brothers writing, a lot of people, inmates writing in, uh, not only the elderly, uh, inmates with chronic care. We have inmates with chronic care that are subject to death because of this COVID-19 and because of the way CDC uh, small law operates, along with uh, other inmates, you know, that are not just uh, being held uh, uh, without cause, but in violation of, of justice, you know, uh, from all the way from the court systems to their order where they're that's because of this because of this uh so-called pandemic so it's a whole entire as a whole you have to get these elderly and these chronic and these chronic people these chronic care people these people that's been held without cause longer than they're supposed to be in, supposed to be in jail or prison should i say and it's, it's, it's outright, it's, it's an injustice to humanity, period. Uh, uh, for real. Thank you. Thank you, brothers. So, Go ahead. So, Tiny, I'm going to just add, Tiny, this is Minister King. I'm just going to add that um, uh, we had a response from, from uh, the National Legal uh, Lawyers Guild. They published our demands in California for the focus. And our focus has been on this particular class is medically fragile. So, like, you can go inside of the uh, San Francisco Bayview where we have a campaign, Liberate the Cage Voices. And um, if you can see the article, it says, Liberate Our Elders. We got a campaign, and uh, our focal point is for everyone. But the focal the, 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 the real focal point is the truth. If you think about the elders, how long they've been held arbitrarily. Now, when you got uh, people that are subjected to uh, having an 88 carriage taker inside of prison. So, those elders, they be people that are tired of them and they're taken care of. And that person can get sick. And he's got to get sick. And it's just great. So, we know CDC, they do all these measurements of uh, 50. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like they're okay, we're giving you to the death because they really don't care. They don't have a real expert. So now California put the focus on the right to carry voices and action everybody is, you know, for the standing for the uh, prison human rights movement, blueprint, the agreement, the hostility, but those people uh, the mass hunger strike from 2011 and 2013, for those that support prisoners that being ostracized and tortured. Right. Torture class. Right. So that's what we found. How we said that we, a lot of these guys are elders. They did 30 and 40 years inside of solitary confinement. Couple that with the health condition. Right. And then you got Corona. It, 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 it's, yeah. Right. And then you got Corona. So yeah. I do right there. We're dealing with a culture genocide. Yeah. Straight up. Yeah. Can I? Can I ask? Can I ask? Um, so you're saying if the the what's the campaign? They go to California Prison Focus, and it's letter writing, or what can people do? Yeah. So right now um, we're putting together a webinar with Cage Universal together with the campaign, and um, we ask the people to write some of the uh, elders to go online and see our demands. Also, not only that. You can also uh, email me at 
Okay. Right. Can I ask also, Brooke, if you could put in the chat um, about the the thing that you guys are asking to flood the city council? Well, you had mentioned it earlier. You yeah. Put that in the chat. And I wanted to, I want to make sure because um, we're getting close to the end of time. We go to seven fifteen, but um, Leroy, there might be questions from the. Yeah. So let's open it up for questions. I'm gonna unmute everybody. And please, people, um, speak one at a time, okay? So I'm gonna unmute everybody for questions. Okay, now you're unmuted. Greg, did you have a question or Pearl or? Um, yeah, I just want clarification on the letter writing campaign the website and, you know, what specifically those, the addresses are. From Minister King? Pearl, from Minister King or from Brooke or both? Both, both. So Brooke is putting it in the chat, right, Brooke? Yep. Okay, and then I'll put the, the California Prison Focus also in the chat. Okay, Brooke, it's, it's tomorrow, right? The the action is tomorrow. The vote is Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Wait, what did you say, Minister? Prisons. Okay. Um. Also, from Jose. While we're at it, were there were there action steps that uh, Jose Bernal was asking for as well? I don't know if you're. Still mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. Uh we're uh, doing um, Tuesday as well. We're mobilizing for Tuesday. Um, you can go to our website for that, uh, emailing supervisors. Um, but also we need public comment on the Tuesday vote. Um, so you can do that, you know, through Zoom, through, you can call in. Um, but we need folks to call in and oppose uh, that $106 million a year power grab by the sheriff. Okay. Okay. Were there any other questions for folks? I have a question if other people don't. Okay. Well, I had a question for, for back to uh, JV because um, so we have some of you didn't hear, we were started, started with JV sort of speaking on the specific class piece and, and it kind of connects to everything that everybody's saying. Um, and back to Brooke, you know, I hear you, Brooke, when you're saying about demands is just ultimatums, right? Without, without action. But then I also wonder when you inside, what else you got? Like you said, we don't got wire cutters. And I just wondered what JV's uh, feeling on that, considering you did the time in that torture cell. Yeah, uh, yeah just thoughts on that. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I think I would agree with Brooke as well that I think the, the only demand I would say is free the people, you know, I mean, this is a life or death situation. This is not, this is like prisoners being during Katrina being held in the jail in New Orleans. You know, there, there's, we don't want, we don't want color pencils. We don't want new socks. <laughs> we want to be let free. So there's nothing else to ask for. There's no other demands. Let them go. And um, and that that's what we want is for them to be let go. And I think that it's important that um, organizations reach out to the prisoners um, as well to, you know, um, to, to, to say, you know, I mean, we're here to support 
But, you know, just like with the isolation, the solitary confinement, um, there's only so much people can do from outside of the prisons mm. and the people within the prisons. Um, you know, I would say that some of the things to do in there, I would think, you know, if, if I was a prisoner, I would think that the only way our voice would be heard is to shut it down, to not work, to not do no work for the guards, to not to go on strike, to go on a hunger strike, to go on a long march, a long hunger strike, just like to stop the isolation. And this hunger strike, I would say, um, the only demand there is is to open them gates, uh, and um, and 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 the people outside of the prisons will will have to step up their support as well. But ultimately, you know, it's going to need to be. Um, you know, because we could do a lot of things from out here, but ultimately the state only understands when prisoners themselves stand up. And, and that's how we got out of isolation and solitary confinement. You know, um, you know, there was a lot of supporters out here and a lot of supporters out here did things for many years and that didn't let us out. What let us out was when we went on this strike. So I think that now's the time uh, for prisoners inside to once again, um, you know, um, flex that muscle that, that, that is in there and um, to, to, you know, to, to, to make a, a statement to the state that uh, we're, not, we're not doing this. We, we, we need to be let out. And um, I think ultimately that's what's going to end up um, getting them gates open is, you know, um, inside and outside support. But um, that's the only thing the state understands, especially during this virus, you know, um, there's nothing else to do, you know, um, there's little things to do, you know, like, like, you know, some of the, you know, um, speakers said, you know, we can uh, contact different officials, we can do different things. But I think that uh, prisoners inside these concentration camps are going to ultimately hold the key to what direction that gate swings, whether it gets tighter or whether that gate opens. Um, and and that's, that's how we open the gates of solitary confinement. And that's how we're gonna open the gates to Santa Rita and to the California and the US prisons is when um, you know, prisoners, it, and, and, and the only thing the state understands is, is hunger strikes. You know, they, they don't understand nothing else. Um, that's the only thing that has so far worked. Um, you know, nothing else has worked. So, you know, I, I think that it's time for, it's time for another action and, and another mm -hmm. internal action supported by external actions. Um, but ultimately, internal action is the key. And, and, and that's what I think is going to do it. That's what I think is going to make them gates uh, fly open uh, so mm -hmm. all the dragons could come out. It's no, it's no. I, I I also think, you know, when, when the gates are open, it's up to us to meet our family, you know, at the gates so they don't get, um, you know, released at midnight and they, you know, get shot at bars. So it's up to us to, you know, go to those gates and meet our family so they don't get shot up you know, trying to get back home. That part. Um, anyone else wanted to answer that? Brooke, did you want to throw anything in on that or Jose? Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, in terms of, like, there's been a wave of resistance inside. I mean, and in terms of the tactics deployed, they're actually being more creative than we are on the outside. I mean, whether it's uh, work stoppages, slowdowns, refusing movements, or just like the account I gave you, just simply making their ability to govern that much harder and asserting themselves. Like they refuse certain movements and like restrictions upon them in dorms. We have prisoners organizing amongst themselves to distribute soap and instructions on basically how to, how to help yourself stay healthy. We got prisoners inside um, in, in groups helping other like people locked up going through withdrawal because the lockdowns and uh, the shelter in place has dried up all the dope pipelines to like, like all kinds of dope pipelines inside. So people are going through withdrawal like crazy. And then that shoots robberies and violence through the roof. We got people helping each other through withdrawal. So like, the prisoners like actually have like an incredible like latitude. 
it's just like apocalyptic fucking consequences for a lot of stuff they try to pull, which is like where we come in on the outside. Like, like if you do something in isolation and you just get smashed on and thrown in the hole forever, like it's got to have impact. And it's like, uh, like a link to the outside, like that bridge is like super important so that it resonates. Like we're, we're the megaphone, you know, and all I'm saying about is demands, demands can be useful in terms of, uh, crystallizing like one's vision or like delineating the line between the people and the state, but they have to be backed up by something and like petitions and demands and all the state sanctioned versions of politics, like aren't enough. Like, like fuck voting. Like I'd rather find the vendors that are just even supplying uniform for CDCR, like Aramark. There's a plant in Oakland. We could shut that down. We could actually say, instead of like, please consider our demands, like we will sabotage all your political efforts for like some elected official to basically um, at every turn to basically put positive spin on things. We'll just sabotage your PR machine like nonstop forever. Mm. Or you could basically say like, we're going to levy a fine on you. Like with just paperwork, you know, we're just going to have a mass writing campaign and enforce like court cases, basically take that five grand for just filings out of you and everything like just think in those terms rather than like asking for things. Right. You know? Okay. He had a question. Go ahead. D. Allen here. Um, my question for Brooke is, what about those corporations who sell products in the marketplace that are made with prison labor? That isn't really a weak point in the system that's whatsoever. Those corporations don't rely on prison labor, and no, no section of the economy relies on prison labor. The political apparatus is much more like vulnerable. You know, the only, the, there are only 60,000 prisoners nationwide that do any sort of like what's called outside industry work. You know, most of it's like overwhelmingly 10 times the amount of labor that goes, gets done inside by prisoners is to maintain the prison itself. Mm. They basically produce their own suffering, mm. which is mm. profound. Right. It, it's like when, it's like when you get beaten and you like, you, your dad told you to go like pick a belt or the fucking stick. And you, they make you participate in your own fucking pain. Make yeah. you complicit. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's fucking perverse. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, in that way, we could shut down. Like, that's what made mass incarceration possible. It's like making the slaves maintain the plantation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me, let me, exactly. Beautiful I'm point. I'm done. Yeah, you want to say something, family? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this, this, this is JB again. Um, one of the most important things that we can be mindful of is that one of the lessons that we learned from the 2011 to 2013 homeless life uh, was more uh, sisters. Uh, died, and I, I, I always send condolences out to their families. Uh, but what that did was that showed the state government's true nature that death is the only thing that they recognize at that point. Mm. So that hit Governor, Governor, War, uh, Governor Brown was over in Ireland at the time and he had to come back and tell uh, uh, director, uh, Secretary of Scott coming in of the CDCR uh, to go, go, go inside of there and sit down with the four principal negotiators and the representatives of uh, 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 on the very different uh, 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 community connections that, that, that you had, you had to uh, uh, settle that. But the problem is that these these guys are 60, 70 years old, and uh, 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 they, they they have illnesses and compromised immune systems. They, they, they couldn't do a home like if, if they wanted to. Here's the thing. Mm. Uh, at no point... And we it, it, it dismissing the government's accountability if it's a government for the people and by the people. So if it's a, if it's a, a government for the people, at some point, even before you and how how they create a pipeline from the oppressed communities of color and white all the way up into the prison, New Jim Crow prison industrial complex. So we should be looking at, once and again, the government and telling them, look at yourself, 
inside of that prison system. Yeah. That's your, it's on your hands. That blood is on your hands. Yeah. You know that you have you have individuals in there that you should immediately get out of there and, and make sure that they don't die. So teach them pointing to that government and that government should be held accountable. That's when you begin to see see some attention come up out of out of that camp over there. And as starting with the legislators, because if you remember during the nineties, uh, the, the the prison the prison guard union started courting the legislators and taking them over to Hawaii on retreat to get them to pass all these draconian bills that we see now uh, uh, that that's resulting in this this massive uh, uh, system of, of warehouse and humans that, that they call California uh, 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 Department of Corrections and Little Hall Rehabilitation. So these deaths that's already occurred inside it, and the deaths that will occur inside should be immediately laid at the at, at, at the uh, 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 doors uh, uh, of both the legislative branch, the, the uh, 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 executive branch, and, and believe it or not, uh, uh, the judicial branch, because as you've seen in the Coleman case, when, when they denied uh, the, uh, the plaintiff's motion to uh, uh, da uh, downsize and immediately release these guys, and uh, uh, in the ask in the Ashley case, uh, they still have not uh, 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 fulfilled, fulfilled the uh, settlement requirements in there. So we, can, we should really point to bring it to their attention that we tortured these guys for not five years, not ten years, not twenty years, not thirty plus years. Right. And, and, and now, now they 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 ill and, and, and you continue to keep them in it with the, until they die. So, so we, we, we need we need that attention. Right. And I, I believe that's, that's what the team is saying. Right. I, I want to say, too, you know, we live in a society where my favorite uh, word, capitalism rules, uh, that has a 100-year-old black elder, EYA Irish Canada, uh, evicted on the gentrified streets of uh, occupied Yulamu, Frisco. So, of course, they're going to kill black and brown and poor people inside those plantation or those in concentration camps and act like they have no culpability. You feel me? Like inside and outside those systems, our bodies don't matter. So I, I just want to lift that up because the other thing that we did at Poor Magazine is we used uh, Penal Code 368 of elder and child abuse to fight uh, these evictions. And there's a connection here. I don't know if you've ever tried to use elder abuse, but for the ADA, I'm sure you guys have used everything because you guys are on point. But um, basically elders who are disabled should also be coming under elder abuse, don't matter if they in those concentration camps or not, and right murder uh, behind that kind of torture. Right, so that's elder abuse, and uh, it's murder. Right, so that, I don't know, and I know that you guys are on point, but I just want to lift that up because we we were able to use that uh, to fight some of these evictions. So that's what we're doing now. I want and I, I, I want to say that you know we are on video, so we're talking and listening. Can you imagine being deaf in prison? Exactly. And prisons don't even have TTY. Exactly. That's going back to 1990. Right. So if you, if you can't hear what's going on, then, you know, that's, that's you know, I, I, under Pete Wilson, um, disabled prisoners took the whole um, state to court. And still today, you know, TTYs are not in prison. So, you know, their prisoners can't even talk to their family. Um, we are, we're running out of time, family. This was extremely powerful discussion. We have some action steps. Um, I do want to ask uh, specifically for, um, for those of you who are listening, watching, and of course this is going to be recorded and posted on Poor News Network on YouTube, and it'll also be uh, parts of it will be played for um, Poor People's Radio on KXU. But for folks who are listening, please follow these action steps. Uh, for our brothers and sisters who are inside, know that we with you, 
um, as poor folks, as disabled folks, as incarcerated peoples, uh, that's why Poor Magazine's here. Like, that's the work that we do. So I wanted to put that out. I think Heather has a question, Heather. I, I do, thank you. I just appreciate you guys. And I just, uh, I, it was Brooke that mentioned, it's my dad that's uh, 73 and he's got autoimmune diseases and diabetes and he's out in August and uh, we did, we lost our court case. Um, to get him released early from CIM, the guy that died from Chino prison was in his dorm. Um, his bunkmate had COVID and was taken out. But I also, um, I used to work at Sierra Conservation Center as a physical therapist for over two years. And um, I know exactly how much CDR, CDCR cares about people and it, they don't. They don't, period. I, I basically did physical therapy on guys that were working for pennies on the day of fire camp putting out firefighters and cal or california fire fires and they're out there busting ass and they get hurt and they just want to come back to you know scc to get some help for their back or whatever they their ankle or whatever got hurt and um i had to fight tooth and nail every single fucking day to get them x-rays or mris or just a little bit more physical therapy and um so I just wanted to throw it out there. If, if you guys want to reach out to me, I would love to have more conversations with people that can get that word out because I, I, I tried to fight it from inside the system. And um, it was actually coincidentally my dad who said, Heather, you can't, you can't fight it from inside the system. You got to go fight it from outside. And 10 years later, he uh, got convicted of a car accident that is still on appeal. And um, he's like, he's never even smoked weed. He's a fucking doctor. He's been in at CIM for two years. He's supposed to get out soon and uh, they won't let him out. And he, if he gets COVID, he's, you know, he's probably not going to make it. But so I just want to throw it out there that like I, I, I worked inside the system in healthcare and CDCR does not fucking care right. about anyone in there. I know it. Can you, I put in the uh, the chat our email, hon. Can you yeah. uh, send us an email? Because we do notes from the inside. Yeah, and we'll absolutely. And up these stories. Absolutely. Right, as much as we can. Um, we're running out of time, family. Um, Leroy? Yeah, yeah. So this is KEXU 96.1 FM, for Magazine, for News Network. Um, we're also doing um, a, a survival handbook. So you can, you know, get more information on the website. And our website is um, poormagazine.org. And uh, our handbook is poormagazine.org, rev um, slash donor. And, and also poorpress.net. And also for folks, um, again, please use the, the channels of Poor News Network and you know, PNNKXU to blast out your stuff. That's what we do this for. And that's what we also do notes from the inside where folks who are inside like JV did went for years and Minister King, uh, send us your work and we'll get it out uh, as far and wide as we're able to as a humble poor people um, media organization along with our badass family at the Bayview and Street Sheet and many more. Um, I do want to say, too, that uh, the next Corona, Katrina to Corona series is going to look at uh, white science. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff where people get called conspiracy theory and all this about how this even got started. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to hear from, you know, the white science themselves. And they're going to break some of this down versus indigenous science, um, how we take care of ourselves. So tune in next Sunday at 6 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Um, again, these recordings are going to be on Poor News Network on YouTube. And um, I think we should end today with, what's the call? Free them all. Free them all. Oh. <laughs> One more time. What's the call? Free them all. Free them all. Hey, we love you all. Power to the people. Take care. Bye. Love you, family. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Jose Bernal. Thank you, JV. Thank, thank you. you to the folks, Minister King William and all the beautiful cats over there. And uh, thank you to everybody who watches and listens. This is just the poor people's media. I ain't no, don't belong to no corporation. It's all just all of us or none of us. 
all of us continuing to keep on keeping on by any means yeah. necessary. Thank, Thank you, Heather. <laughs>